Hello, welcome to this webcast to the Edison alumni on TCP-based discovery. My name is Juval Lowy. I'm the principal of iDesign. We specialize in system architecture and project design. Also do a lot of work with Microsoft. Um, the material we're going to see today in this webcast is going to be in the next edition of the WCF uh, book, hopefully published early next year. I was part of both the .NET and later on WCF design effort, wrote many of the white papers for Microsoft. In fact, I wrote the white paper for MSDN on WCF discovery. Microsoft recognized me as a software legend due to the impact I've had on the industry over the years. And if you need to get in touch with me or anything related to this webcast, it's going to be iDesign.net. So let's talk about the objective for this webcast. We'll discuss how to benefit from discovery even where UDP is actually unavailable. And sadly, that's more common than not. And you'll see that discovery is more than just plain old discovery. In fact, it will give you an option of literally using a ready-made centralized configuration. In many cases, people just find config files to be unpalatable. So they end up with some kind of a centralized config story. But that thing is not. Uh, uh, readily made, and it has its own issues. This will literally substitute the need for doing that. Just as important, you're going to see in this webcast for fun with advanced programming techniques spanning WCF, C Sharp, Parallel Programming, and how to utilize various of the moving parts in Service Model EX. In fact, I can summarize in about two slides how to use the technology. We'll see it. Basically, it's one line here, one line there. So almost all of it is going to be spent on the Kung Fu with programming, you will see. I'll try and cover discovery, and maybe I'll hint as to well doing announcement as well, if we still have time. So why do we need discovery? We need discovery. If you look at classic object orientation, developers have learned long time ago it's not a good idea to burn the type of the object in the client's code. Even if you use upper classes, even if you use interfaces, there's still going to be new type somewhere in the client's code. If you use a class factory, you encapsulate it. And so you just said to the class factory, class factor will give me your interpretation of who needs to be the object behind this interface. And then if you need to change that type provider, all you do is make one change in one factory as opposed to across all your clients. And in the world of service orientation, the address is the equivalent of the type. If we have two services which support the same contract and the same binding, then the only differentiating element is the address. So in the world of SOA, the address is the equivalent of the type. And the same rationale that says don't burn the type in the client, and the client says don't burn the address in the client. It doesn't matter if you put it in the code or if you put it in config. When you make a change to the address, it's a painful change. And discovery allows you to avoid that pain. Now, with regular WCF calls, the service has to know the port of the pipe is available up front. You have to guess port 8000 is available. The client has to know not just the port, but also the service machine. And if you try and resolve those things using config files, it's a big mess. It works on a small scale. It doesn't work on a big scale. So it would be great if the client could discover the address at runtime. That's, in fact, the only thing WCF Discover gives you out of the box. I say there's two other things would be great. One is if the service could use any available address this other runtime. There's nothing in the service code that says it has to be port 8000. Now, for that, you need service model EX, which is the iDesign framework on top of WCF that automates many of these tasks. In addition, it would be nice if you could just avoid config file altogether. And again, Service Model EX gives you that with regular WCF discovery. WCF discovery uses UDP. UDP is a way of doing a broadcast. And the pattern looks like this. In step one, the client blasts the network with UDP discovery requests. Now, services can optionally offer a discovery endpoint over UDP. And in step two, they receive that request. If they support the contract the client is calling for, in step three, they respond back to the client. The client now has the address and proceeds to invoking the service as usual. And that's what WCF Discovery gives you out of the box. The problem is it relies on UDP. UDP, at best of time, is a questionable protocol. First of all, it's unreliable. The client has no way of knowing if the request was actually received, nor can the service know the response was received by the client. And so the client tends to sit there for a period of time and saying, you got something for me, you got something for me, and discover and discover. That creates simply a noisy implementation. Now, in some environment, UDP is simply not supported. IT departments prohibit the use of UDP. Now, they do it because they view UDP as a big boogeyman and just block it, 
or maybe accidentally somebody blocks it on the firewall. And so if you have an enterprise environment, it's quite likely UDP is not going to work there. It works in an environment that you can predetermine and, and control. And that's especially the problem for independent software vendors that have no control whatsoever over the customer's department uh, IT uh, policies. And so with some customers, if you base your system on UDP, it would work. With some customers, it won't. So now you have to start forking and branching your code based on the IT policies. And that's just a big pain. So the solution for this problem is recognizing the following. At the heart of all discovery mechanisms is the broadcast or a query for the contracts. Now, WCF uses UDP broadcast. But once you recognize that at the heart of all discovery is actually a broadcast, you can approximate the WCF discovery without relying on UDP because you can substitute TCP for UDP by having a dedicated PubSub service that would do the broadcast for you. That would enable you to maintain the overall communication pattern of a broadcast discovery and invocation. In fact, if you service model EX, what you will see here is an identical programming model. And because you can now have discovery that works everywhere, it starts servicing as, as your centralized metadata repository. In fact, you don't have to have a, a, any kind of repository. You just allow discovery to get you at one time the address and the binding and, and the endpoints. So you would use a, a single PubSub service to service a discovery request. Now, that service needs to build a well-known base address. And that address can be in config, can be programmatically setting, can be convention driven. In fact, service model EX would allow you to do all three. If you'd like config files, fine, put LSA in config file. If you'd like to do it programmatically, there's helper method for that, or you can avoid any kind of setting and let, let the framework use convention to drive the others. All discovery is made this way one time. There's no need for a repository that maintains a list of all running services. That would simply get stale over time. And if you do things real time, you respond to changes in the environment, and you can even have dynamic addresses where the services simply pop on whichever address as need to. The services need to subscribe to discovery request. And so there's high discovery subscription in service model EX that allow the service to subscribe and unsubscribe to those discovery requests. Now, the services themselves support an iDiscovery contract, which has a single method on discovery request, letting the client say, do you support this particular contract and do you have any scopes on top of it? Now, the actual response is done using duplex callback to the iDiscovery callback contract. You see that defined as part of the service contract. As a result, the client gets always the up-to-date snapshot of all the services in each request. The iDiscovery callback simply contains a discovery response that has the address of the service. Again, the iDiscovery response is where you receive the response from the services back to the client. Now, because you have this middleman of a PubSub service, the actual architecture looks like this. There's a centralized discovery service, which is basically a dedicated PubSub for discovery requests. In step one, the two yellow services go to discovery subscription and say, I'd like to subscribe to receive discovery requests. The discovery service supports iDiscovery, which is the same contract that the services support. As a result, the act of querying the discovery service is the same as querying any other services it's basically the technique calling my work the meta subscribers. So in step two, the client calls a discovery service and say to its iDiscovery, do you have any services supporting this contract? The discovery service then broadcasts in step three to all the services it knows about, saying, do you support this particular contract? In step four, the service is called back or with iDiscovery called back to the discovery service. And the discovery service then calls back in step five to the iDiscovery callback implementation of the client letting it know all the services that supported the required contract. And then in step six, the client simply goes to invoke the services. Now, all of this pattern is actually baked into service model EX, and it can be deployed on each side with just one line of code. I will show you some 80 slides of behind the scenes, how it's done. But the actual act of doing it is just one line of code here, one line of code over there. It's incredibly easy to use. The the actual implementation of the discovery service is a helper class called discovery service. As you can see, it only has a constructor. There's really nothing you need to do. All you have to do is instantiate it and open it. It will support the discovery subscription management and will publish the discovery request and manage the callbacks. The discovery service has to maintain a list of all subscribing services. The subscribing service has to subscribe and unsubscribe and notifying their will to receive discovery requests. 
And so here's the code behind the discovery service. It has a list of addresses. It has iDiscovery subscription dot subscribe where you add to the list and unsubscribe and you remove to the list. Now I'll show you later on that this is a highly concurrent and asynchronous mechanism. And so everything here is to be done uh, synchronized. Look at the use of the method impel attribute to ensure that all code inside subscribe and unsubscribe is actually done in a synchronous manner. There's no need to explicitly manage the lock and that the list itself is synchronized. The actual discovery itself takes an undiscovery dot on discovery request where the client asks to the discovery service, please let me know about the services. Now, when the client call it, they have to provide the callback reference of the type of I uh, discovery callback to actually receive the callbacks. The discovery service would grab that reference to the client and we basically chain it to the callbacks coming back from the services. Now, in order to do that, the discovery service uses a nested private class called discovery callback. whose sole implementation is to receive the callback from the services and forward it to the client. Now, the main use of it is actually to maintain the concurrent nature of the callback. And so it's just a path loop, but a concurrent one. So look at the double step way of doing it. We, in the discovery service, we have a nested class called discovery callback that has a callback behavior attribute that makes sure it doesn't use any synchronization context and it allows concurrent multiple access. The constructor of discovery callbacks accepts the callback reference, which is basically just a callback to the client, and caches it in a member variable. And the implementation of discovery response simply delegates to it. So it's basically a pass through, but its sole purpose is to do it in a concurrent way. In addition, you can't really pass the client's callback directly to services because that has to be on a local discovery service context. The discovery service now has to bluff the network with discovery request. It's done using the uh, parallel programming library in .NET 4.5, it basically queues up this request over the IR completion thread pool. Now that is actually done using a dedicated delegate called discover. Discover creates a proxy in each uh, task to a particular service based on a list of addresses and asynchronously in parallel ask those proxies to discover. Now let's look at the code. Here's the implementation inside the discovery service of iDiscovery.onDiscovery request. It first grabs from the operation context a reference to the calling client. That's a callback to the actual client wanting to discover. It then creates an object of a type discovery callback, giving it that callback as a parameter. Remember, that's the pass through object. The actual work is done inside a discover delegate. So if you look at the top, it discovers an action delegate called discover that receives a single address. It then creates a proxy to a particular service behind that address using a duplex channel factory. Note this is not the WCF duplex channel factory. This is a service model EX which receives two contracts, iDiscovery and iDiscovery callbacks. The duplex channel factory of service model EX is type safe, and so it verifies the connection between iDiscovery and iDiscovery callbacks. It creates an, uh, a callback uh, object, which is basically uh, the wrapper class that we get from before, that's set as a construction parameter to the proxy and gives it the address to the service. The actual discovery is done in the bold line service proxy dot on discovery request, which simply passes to it the contract name it needs to discover. Now, that call would carry with it the callback reference to that nested class. Now, there's some bookkeeping and cleanup to be done. First of all, how do we know when it's okay to close the proxy to that service? It's only okay to close it once the service has already responded over the callback. And so if you try and just call on discovery request and immediately shut down the proxy and close it, you will prevent the callback from the service to the discovery service. So the trick here is to monitor the closing or the faulting of the channel going back towards the discovery uh, uh, service. And that's basically done here by taking the client callback object and monitoring its closed or faulted event and giving it another anonymous method that simply closes the proxy. Now, what if nobody ever closes a proxy for what, no, nobody ever calls, closes that uh, channel for whatever reason? So the trick here is to actually have a safety net of a timeout. And that's what task.delay is all about. It creates a new task and simply delays for it uh, for the send timeout of the binding used to issue the discovery request in the first place. Basically, it says, if the timeout has elapsed, then it's actually okay to close the proxy because they can't actually call it anyway. 
Now, as soon as that task is complete, there's a continuation. That's what dot continue with does. And in dot continue with, it simply asks to just invoke the cleanup delegate and simply go and close the proxy. So you have a safety net here. If the closed event of the channel is called, you close the proxy. If the timeout elapses, you also close the proxy. Now, at the very bottom is m underscore addresses dot for each async discover. For each async is an extension method in service model EX that does a for each in a parallel and a synchronous way. I'll show the code for that in a second, but look how it reads. It reads almost like natural language. Addresses for each async discover. So you take the collection of addresses and you run an extension method on it that takes each address and invokes it in a parallel or synchronous way the discover delegate. And as a result, let me go back to the previous slide, you'll see we're still in the context of idiscovery dot on discovery request. And as soon as that happens, it takes all the other things it knows about and blasts all of them with a synchronous, concurrent, and parallel discovery. Let's look at the implementation of for each uh, async. It's an extension method for the innumerable collection in .NET. What it does, it creates a list of tasks. And for each item in the collection, it does task run on it. It simply invokes a delegate you give it and basically creates a list of uh, tasks for continuation or for what have you. But the net result is that almost natural language like way of reading the code. Now, I mentioned that there's a timeout as a safety net. You always have to think in here in terms of what happens if the assumption is not met and you have to do some cleanup. Note again, this is fully concurrent. The service is subscribed concurrently. The client can discover concurrently. And the clients are configured for multiple concurrency and no synchronization context, so you can always call back to the client. You will see that in a second. All state access, on the other hand, has to be synchronized. Everything is done asynchronously, so you always have to think about when do I clean up, how do I protect state, and so on. The discovery callback, like I mentioned, is fully concurrent. It receives the callback concurrently, so the same service can call back to the same callback object inside the discovery service concurrently. It would always be forwarded concurrently to the client. And even though we used some pretty nifty .NET 4.5 programming here, we also worked on a comparable version that is in plain .NET 3.0. And the reason we have that is because what if you can't use .NET 4.0? This uh, mechanism enables you to actually use discovery even in a forward compatible way. The actual act of hosting the discovery uh, factory is done using this helper method called create discovery service. So if you want to deploy a discovery service, you have to do this one line, discovery factory dot create discovery service. That's it. That's all you have to do in order to host the discovery service. So it's one line. There's no need for config file. There's nothing here. Now, the one thing you don't know in advance is what's going to be the port number. And so you can select the port number. Or you can just take the default. And you will see the default, it's uh, something else. But you can say just zero or just leave it blank. That would be good. So that's all the code you need to deploy the service we've just seen. Now, how does create discovery service work? It has to actually do two things. It has to actually host a service that opens up both a discovery subscription and a discovery endpoints. And so you have to have two endpoints and two addresses. So it will default to port 808. And the reason we chose it, this is the default TCP port. In most environments, that's going to be the last TCP port anybody's ever going to block. Now, if you don't specify a machine name, you can specify localhost, or you don't specify anything, it will default to localhost. If you think about, for the discovery service, localhost always works, because it works on its own machine. It's the other parties, the services and the clients, that have to know the machine name. Now, if you don't specify anything, it will be convention-based. And so if you look at the two lines at the bottom, that would be the convention it would use. It would use the machine name, port number, discovery service, slash discovery, or slash discovery subscription. But if you don't like it, you can set anything you like. In fact, as helper class discovery factor uses a nested class called address to manage all addresses. And so let's look at the code behind it. It will let you either explicitly set it or even use a config file or some kind of a hybrid where you explicitly set something from a config file. Let's look at the code. So here's the nested class address of discovery factory. It has a discovery server representing the name of the discovery service machine and a port number. The default is 808 and localhost. Now here's some helper methods. It has a property called discovery service. If you don't set anything, it will first try and get it from config. 
So you can always use config file. There's nothing that says you can't use config file if you like. So you can put any kind of information config file. It will try and use it. And if there's something you config, it will use it. Now, if there's nothing you config, get discovery service and config will return null, in which case it will construct the discovery service address by concatenating the discovery service machine name with the port number and the convention. There's also two additional set methods. One takes an explicit endpoint address. That's your uh, option for explicitly setting up an address on the fly, the way you like it, and it will just use it. And there's also a set discovery service that takes an endpoint name from a config file. That lets you still keep it in config file, but being very discreet which endpoint you like to use. And so there's a helper method called get address from config, which takes the type of the contract and does passing of the config file to actually get the address out of it. You can actually, there's APIs in WCF and in the configuration namespace for letting you do that. We're going to skip it for today. But look, it said get discovery service from config, the method underneath it. That one simply says, find for me the endpoint that has the iDiscovery contract in it that has this particular name. So you can use a config file. You can use explicit address. You can use programmatic form referring to a config file. And you can also just take the defaults of a convention. Everything is open for you. There are similar methods available in the Abbas class for managing discovery subscription as top of the discovery uh, services. Now, how do you actually uh, launch this discovery service? You simply use create discovery service. That would add a compatible base address for you. Now, we don't use a base address. It's just for sensibility and consistency in the future. The discovery service will use this TCP binding with the following properties. It will be a reliable binding, it will enable transaction, it will do transport security. It will also use some kind of infinite timeout that's required later for announcements. Here's the code for the create discovery service. That's the one line that actually launches for you the discovery service. If you don't provide any port, it will simply take the default, else it will set it. It will create a base address based on the address inside addresses. It will create a host with that base address. And now it needs to add a discovery endpoint. The first thing it will do, it will check to see if there's anything config. If there's anything config, it will just use config. Now, you can also, by the way, set that particular thing yourself, like I said before. Now, if you add the address using uh, config, it will simply if you don't use it config, it will simply programmatically add the endpoint. And again, it would fish the address by address.discovery service. As you can see, it's fairly straightforward. The same logic is doing it for iDiscovery subscription as well. Here's the code that returns the binding across the entire framework. It's going to be the same TCP binding using reliability, security, and transactions. Now you have to launch discoverable services. Now you have to launch a server that wants to be discovered this way. So discovery factor is a one line called create discoverable host, which returns for you a host wrapping one of your services that can be discovered. It's one line, that's the only line you would need on the service side to plug into discovery service. Now that host needs to do several things. First it needs to host your service, but you also need to implement iDiscovery and subscribe to the discovery request. Now because we're already here, we might as well turn on regular WCF discovery and regular announcements. If you still want to use regular WCF discovery, if it's available, it will use that as well. It will also automatically add a max endpoint for you. Here's the one line you would need. Discovery factory dot create discoverable host. That's it. And it returns to you a service host of T, which is a service model X uh, subclass of service host. There's some other uh, goodies on it. Look at it just as a regular host. So here's all the code you would need on the service side to connect to this framework. It's a discovery factor that create discoverable host. That's it. And now you host your service, and it would actually be monitoring the discovery request and so on. Now, optionally, you can also set where the discovery service is. And so it's completely optional to do it programmatically, to do it in config, and so on. In most cases, I suspect you're going to gravitate towards the convention, in which case, don't set anything. It would just work. Now, the discovery factor uses a nested private class called discovery request service. That one implements iDiscovery and needs to respond to the discovery request. Now, its constructor takes a collection of the service that you implement endpoint, and those are the endpoints you want to respond to discovery requests for. The on discovery request implementation of iDiscovery obtains a reference to the callback object provided now by the discovery service. It will look for a match between the request and the actual endpoints and responds if there's a match. 
So here's the code inside the uh, helper class discovery request service. It's basically an implementation of iDiscovery. The constructor simply takes a collection of endpoints and stores it. Now, I know it sounds strange to use in WCF a parameter as constructor. This would actually be OK because we're going to host it as a singleton. The actual implementation looks like this. The first thing it does is it grabs a, a reference from the operation context to the callback to the discovery callback. That's the one provided by the discovery service. Then it scans all the endpoints in the collection of endpoints it got in the construction, looking for a match between the construct and the scope. And that's all what this if and for each is doing. Now, if there is a match, it will simply use the callback reference that points, remember, using duplex to the discovery service to actually respond with discovery information. Now, the create discoverable host actually has to use two hosts. First is for the discovery, discoverable service itself. That's your service with the business logic. Now, because you're using discovery, it actually uses dynamic address on it. You don't have to use any kind of a predetermined address. It will pick up an available address and use it. It will also add the max endpoint and UDP discovery on top of that, just in case. The second host is for implementing discovery requests. But that one, we can use a singleton. And we can use dynamic address for it as well. So as long as the address for the singleton is actually unique, you can actually have singletons. You can kind of get away with it in WCF. And so here's the code inside create discoverable host. The first, it creates a host for your actual business logic service. And that's what the dot, dot, dot is about. It will also add UDP discovery and a max endpoint. Underneath that, we're going to create a discovery request service. That's a service to implement iDiscovery. And note, we're using a C-sharp constructor for it, giving it a parameter. Then we take that C-sharp object and we give it to the service host as a construction parameter. It turns out, you can actually do it in WCF. You can use service host to construct a singleton and use parameterized constructors only in the case of the singleton. So now we have a request for handling. We have a request host for handling the discovery requests. The question is whether we host it. And so we're going to use discovery helper dot available TCP base address, which is a helper method inside service module EX that picks up any available TCP base address based on available ports. We concatenate to it the type of the service and for discovery endpoint, just to make it easier to look with through debugging. And then we programmatically add a discovery endpoint using the binding and the address we just created. Next, we go to the host that actually hosts your service. We subscribe to its open and closed events. And the reason we have to subscribe to its open event, because that would be our queue for doing two things, both to open the request host to handle the discovery request, and to subscribe to the discovery service discovery requests. And so it's fairly straightforward. We open the host, and then we create a proxy against the discovery service. Note again the uh, um, use of the uh, uh, address class to actually grab the address based on convention. And we simply say subscribe. In closing, we do the opposite. Get a proxy against the discovery service. We unsubscribe from discovery request, and we close the host that hosts the discovery endpoint. And then we return the host, and you can just go and use it as a regular host. Now, when it comes to doing the discovery for the client side, there's a duplex discovery client. It's modeled after the discovery client in regular WCF, providing a near identical programming model. The only difference is you may optionally want to set the address of the discovery service. But everything else is done in a polymorphic manner. So you can actually gut out a UDP implementation of discovery and use this one with minimal impact to all clients. So again, the three uh, constructors you see over here are optional. You can take the default, or you can give it an endpoint name in config, or you can give it a programmatic uh, endpoint. This is just like a regular WCF proxy. And so here's the implementation of it. The parameterless constructor would just use the defaults and the convention. You can slurp an endpoint out of config, or you can just force feed an address using uh, an endpoint address object. Now, what it needs to do, it needs to post the discovery request and then sits back and wait for the callbacks coming back from the discovery service. So it uses a nested private class called client discovery response callback. And its main use, again, is to do this concurrent delegation of the callbacks. And the actual work is done using a delegate you give it. So here's the nested private class client discovery response callback. Its constructor takes the contract you're looking for. 
and delegates to use for the actual delegation of the callback. So on discovery response, simply by and large does some matching to see that the response from the service matches the contract you're looking for just to make sure no hiccups. By and large, it would always match. And it uses this action delegate to go and respond back to the discovery client itself. Now, the actual work is done using the find method. The find method is using this delegate to actually process each of those uh, callbacks. It will instantiate the client discovery response callbacks and will delegate on each response using that delegate. And so let's look at the code. The first thing find does, it does some uh, bookkeeping to create a filtering criteria and populate in it the contract and SPC you're looking for, and that's all good. Now, Microsoft never intended you to do this directly, so we have to use a helper class to actually create uh, a find response uh, object, because constructor is normally private. It creates a handle, a weightable weight, uh, weight handle. You will see in a second why. The actual add endpoint delegate takes an address and scopes and create an endpoint discovery metadata wrapping that address and the scope, attaching in a for each loop the scope to every uh, uh, piece of uh, uh, address in there. And then it has a response object. It needs to add to it the metadata of the endpoint we just discovered. Now, the client, when he does, when he does find, can say, I want to only wait uh, for the first three services to respond. Typically, you say I want to wait for max results of one, meaning just find for me the first one. And so the delegate and endpoint checks to see if you reach the max results criteria. And if you do, it sets the handle and return. The client now needs to actually go and do the actual discovery request. It creates a proxy against the discovery service. And that's basically what you see just below the first chunk of code. It creates a proxy against the discovery service. It's, again, the channel uh, factory, but it's the types of channel factory from service model EX. Now, that channel factory needs to receive a callback object. So it actually instantiates a callback at the top of the slide, giving it the contract and delegate to use. And then it simply does discovery service proxy dot on discovery request. And not just blast the discovery service with the discovery request. And now it has to wait for discovery request to come along. Now, it doesn't know what's going to happen first. You're going to max out on the results or the timer is going to expire. So it simply waits on the handle for it to happen. Now, if you see if those two handles are tied, the delegate, when it checks that the max result is uh, exceeded, sets the event that would unblock the client. And so then you just close the handle. And you, of course, have to close the proxy the discovery service, and you return the response. Now, that's giving you just polymorphic WCF discovery. It doesn't do uh, much beyond that. Our goal here was just to mimic the WCF mechanism. But that was very raw. So just like I did for the regular WCF discovery, discovery factory has create channel method. Now, think of discovery factory as your ultimate class factory. And so create channel would wrap the discovery client find method to actually go into the discovery factor, the discovery for you. What it would do, it would actually be doing next base discovery. What does it mean? It would not actually first try and do discovery for the business logic contract you're looking for. It would actually do discovery for the max. It would try and find your max endpoint. Once it finds your max endpoint, it would perform a max query against it. From the max, it will receive the address and the binding. It will then create a channel against it, return to your proxy. All of that is done in create channel. All of that is using the duplex discovery client I showed you in the previous slides. There's also create channels, plural, which is sent to you an array of all the services that match the, the um, criteria you were looking for. And so you can either do cardinality of one with create channel or all of them. Now, you put all of this together, and it looks like this. By and large, the only thing the client will need to do is discovery factory dot create channel I my contract. Done. And you're going to get now the proxy to the service uh, that was used, that used dynamic discovery to discover. Now, optionally, you may want to give it the address of discovery service. Like I said, you can use config. You can use convention. You can programmatically set it. It's completely up to you. If we put it all together, this is what it looks like. 
You have the definition of the contract and definition of the service. And then you see the three lines of code you need on the client, on the service, or discovery service side. On the client, you just use discovery factor to create channel. On the service, you say discovery factory dot create discoverable host. On the discovery service side, you say discovery factory dot create discovery service, and you're done. So these three lines of code now gives you this UDP-free way of doing discovery. But it's more than that. How many times have you seen developers in certain environments that come up with uh, some kind of a centralized metadata repository and they have like this discovery proxy or some kind of a list of running services and they go about uh, uh, going there and have to maintain it and such and it's a big pain but it's less of a pain than managing a big chunk of config files. If you have 5,000 clients, it's completely impractical to manage config files on that scale. And so this is a way out. This lets you have a very simple deployment model as long as you dedicate somewhere for running the discovery service, you move the bits to the target machines, and you either use a config file that always is the same config file, because now you don't have to point to the services, you have to point just to the discovery service, or use conventions, and there you go. All of a sudden, everything just works. Now let's talk about announcements. The service in the previous model where we client is the client doing a discovery, the service was fairly passive. It was sitting there in the, in the background waiting for client to discovery. The problem now is that what if services come and go, come and go, and every time they come and go, come and go, they do it on a different address. So now it's better to reverse the relationship and have the clients be passive and the service be active. So now the service can broadcast the client its state, and that's called announcement. So WCF supports ever since 4.0 the ability to broadcast to clients the availability. And so there's two types of announcements. There's hello and there's bye. Now, the notification contain the uh, service endpoints contract scope and address. And if you have three endpoints, you have to do three announcements. So you have to do an announcement per endpoint. If you use UDP, it looks like this. The client is now passively sitting there in the background using UDP endpoint that implements announcements. And the services use hello and bye over UDP to blast all clients, and now the clients know the address, and they go and notify, and, and they go and call these services as needed. Now, announcement is not mutually exclusive with discovery. You can support just discovery, just announcements, or both. Exactly the same problem we had with, with WCF UDP discovery, with WCF UDP announcements. What if UDP is unavailable? And so you can approximate WCF announcement by substituting UDP for a TCP-based PubSub service. And that enables you to maintain the overall communication pattern of announcements in an identical WCF programming model. So now, the solution architecture looks like this. You have a dedicated PubSub service, the clients become party subscribers, and the services are active publishers. That service has to be on a single well-known address because you have to know how to subscribe to the notification and have to go to it also to notify. And the same with the TCP-based discovery. The address can be in config, or you can set it programmatically using the helper methods, or you can just use conventions. The clients have to subscribe to receive those uh, announcements. And they would continue to invoke the service the same as usual. So the diagram of it would look, uh, let me show the diagram in a second, but here's the contracts. We have an announcement subscriptions. This is what the clients use to subscribe to their uh, ability to receive the announcements. And we're going to use here a callback contract to receive the announcements. Now, the nice thing about using a duplex is that client machines are often very much locked uh, down. But even on a locked down machine, if the client called out to the discovery service, the callback is going to be allowed on that uh, same uh, channel, and you're going to be allowed in. The services need to notify the clients using I announcements. We simply has on hello and on by. The PubSub service, a discovery service, would support I announcement the same as uh, the clients. Basically, it would be like a meta subscriber and would forward the calls back to the clients. Now, if you're going to do this kind of uh, 
announcement, Duplex has to be long running. So the clients are going to be sitting there in the shadows for a very long period of time waiting for announcement. So you want to use an infinite timeout on the session. This is not the call timeout, this is the session timeout. So finally, here's what it looks like architecture-wise. We have a centralized discovery service that supports an announcement subscriptions. Clients go and subscribe in step one and say, I'd like to receive announcements. Services at some point come and go. When they come and go in step two, they blast the discovery service with I announcements. The clients also support I announcements, and so they, uh, the discovery service calls back to the clients and forwards the calls to them, and then the clients have the others in step four, they simply go and invoke the call same as usual. The discovery service we do before actually supports announcement as well as discovery. There's no direct interaction required other than hosting it. In fact, it's exactly the same code as I showed you before. There's really nothing here. The create discovery service would add announcement support. It basically has to add the subscription and the uh, announcement endpoint, and so it, it would use the same port number and machine name as I showed you before. It will default for the conventions you see in those two bold lines. Again, you can use explicit endpoint settings if you like. You can use config file. You can use conventions. In fact, the Abbas class has announcement Abbas management, both for announcement subscriptions and for the announcement Abbas itself, exactly the same as what you've seen before. The discovery service needs to manage a list of subscribers. It's just a regular list, and in subscriber, not subscriber, would simply manage it. All announcements are going to be asynchronous, they're going to be concurrent using the parallel uh, uh, library. So here's a discovery service implementation of the announcement. The constructor instantiates a list of I announcement, which is going to maintain the list of all the clients. And I announcement subscription and subscribe, in subscribe you add to the list, and in unsubscribe you remove from the list. Note, by the way, the check that the list actually is already containing it. So if you say subscribe, 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 you're only subscribing once. This is good because uh, in case the client went down and they come back and they resubscribe, there's no harm done. Here's the actual act of publishing the announcement event. The implementation of on hello, which is what, or I announcement dot on hello is what the service is used to notify. It interacts with the uh, notified clients list. And so it has a delegate that takes uh, a client I announcement implementation and simply notifies it using on alone. Now you want to push these announcement asynchronously and concurrently and so again we use the service model EX extension for each async and we say notify the client for each async hello and it just reads like natural English now. The buy is exactly the same except you say buy. That's it, that's basically what it took to, uh, uh, to do that. Now the create discoverable host has to now add support for announcement for your service, for your business logic service. Now, the actual code of doing it is exactly the same as before. You just say create discoverable host for your service, and now you have service that supports announcements. What it will do now in the open and close events of the host for the discoverable service, it would also fire the event because we know about the opening and the close of the business logic service. And so let's look at the code. So again, we inside the create discoverable host method. So after we created the host, we subscribe to the host open and the closed event. In the open, we create an R announcement proxy against the discovery service, and we publish the availability event to it. That's done using the helper method publish availability event. In the closed event, we create a proxy against the discovery service again, and we push on by. So obviously, the bulk of the work is done in publish availability event. Let's review that code. That one is a helper method that needs to announce asynchronously and in parallel to all clients. Now, we have a problem here that you have to close the proxy only once the last endpoint is announced. Because if you close it after the first one, you're not going to be around for the second. So here's the code. Publish availability event, the bulk of it is done using two delegates, one notify, one publish. The notify delegate takes an endpoint, and there's some helper in service model EX that looks up the scope out of it. And then you do notification. It simply takes the delegate and does notification to it. Now, if you look at the previous slide, you will see that for notification, we simply gave it the method on the proxy we created. 
The action publish delegate takes the collection of endpoints and says parallel for each notify. Basically does a parallel for each. The task.run publish takes the publish delegate and asynchronously pushing it out. Now you may want to ask yourself why we're not using the uh, for each async. And the reason is if we do for each async, it would push it and immediately return and then we'll be able to know when to close a proxy. But what parallel for each does, it does the parallel for each, meaning the for each itself is done in parallel, but that method only returns once the for each is completed. So now what you can do is you can do task one publish, which takes the notify delegate, does all of them in parallel, but only returns once authentication is done, and then we can safely go and close the proxy. Now where is the proxy? We don't actually pass it the, the proxy explicitly, we just pass a delegate. So what you can do is you can go to the target property of the delegate, which we happen to know is the proxy that we put against the discovery service, cast that car communication object, and close that one. And parallel for each is another extension method in service model EX, which simply wraps the parallel for each in regular.net. Now, the client, if you look at the architecture, still has to expose some kind of an endpoint for receiving notification. The way it's done in WCF, it's very raw. You have to literally go through a lot of hoops to uh, um, go and implement that service. So for regular discovery, at the time, I implemented an announcement sync helper class that maintains for you a ready-made address of all the services of the type T that, that they've uh, notified you. So we extended that by deriving called duplex announcement sync which implements for you the announcement callback directly and would do the subscription and everything else. The uh, helper class also has methods for managing the address of the discovery. You can use discoveryfactory.address directly. You can use config, you know the drill. So here's the class you will need on the client side. You have a duplex announcement sync, which derives from announcement sync and supporting I announcements. Note again, it's completely asynchronous and concurrent. The code the client would use would look like this. Optionally, you may want to construct an address against a discovery service. You instantiate a duplex announcement sync giving it uh, uh, the address or not, or you can actually just set the address in discovery factory dot address, and then you open the sync. The moment you open the sync, you basically are ready to receive notifications. So let's suppose a notification has arrived. You go for the first address in the sync. You have some kind of a binding. You go and create a proxy against it. Use the proxy, and you can close it. When you're done, close the sync. Here's implementation of the duplex announcement sync. It derives from the announcement sync. It overrides on open. Based on open does a lot of heavy lifting initialization at the top, opening services for you and everything else. It also supports, by the way, regular announcements. In our version of open over here, we create a proxy against the discovery service using the duplex channel factory. Again, it's the type safe version of the duplex channel factory giving it ourselves as implementation of iAnnouncements and saying subscribe. Now, this would be open-ended. Until you close it, it will keep subscribing, so the session has to be with an infinite timeout, which is what I showed you before in the binding property of the discovery uh, factory. Close simply unsubscribes and calls the base close. The implementation of iAnnouncement hello does some uh, uh, arguments uh, creation and then calls the base class on hello. And on hello here is simply a delegate. So in fact, there's also a delegate based model on top of the announcement sync. You subscribe to that delegate to say a notification has arrived. All of that gives you this very nice programming model on the client side. You have some kind of a contract, some kind of a service. Now those services announce. What do you do? On the client side, you create a new sync, giving it uh, 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 a construction parameter or an address or so, or just take the convention. And you open it, and the moment you open it, now you are ready to receive announcements. And then you can simply go and create the proxies based on addresses, the second address, the first address, whatever you like, inside the sync. On a service, nothing has changed. You just say discovery factor dot create discoverable host. So think about it, it's the same service code, and it does discovery, it does announcement, and so on. On a discovery service, what do you do? Exactly the same, discovery factory, dot create discovery service and you're done. You have now discovery, you have announcement, you have both, and you're good to go without ever mentioning UDP. Okay, so I have a client, a discovery service, and a service. So let's look at the 
discovery service first. Here's all the code you need. Look. Create discovery service. That's it. Now, I could decide that I'm using port 8001 or the default. It doesn't really matter. So I'm just demonstrating that I can do this. That's all I need to do on the service side, on the discovery service. I just look at the actual service. The service said, I'd like to create a discoverable host on this service. That's it. The client, when I click this button, is going to use discovery fact that create channel to actually go and create it. And again, I can optionally set the address. I can do config or everything else. Let's see the implementation of the service. The implementation is going to show us the message box. OK. So let's run the whole thing. This is full-blown Max discovery with uh, discover, Max endpoint and, and retrieving the metadata and everything else. And you can see it's, it's pretty fast. I mean, I'm running inside the virtual PC, and you can see this is pretty instantaneous. And just to prove to you that, indeed, this was all done using discovery, I'm going to stop debugging here. And we're going to look inside the host here. And if you know where to dig, you will see that the address is going to be completely dynamic. So we're going to launch it. Oops, sorry, not this one. I want to do it on this one. OK, so I'm going to start opening the description of the service. And why don't I see it? Description. I'm going to go to endpoints. And I know you don't actually see anything useful here, but you can see that the addresses are all kind of like 4, 3, 6, 4, 4. OK, this is a completely dynamic address that was constructed on the fly. And so there is no way I would ever be able to connect with this service and show the message box unless I was using discovery. Let me also do a demo here using announcements. Actually, let me actually do this demo again. I'm going to show you several clients, several services. So let's bring up another client. So if we call this guy, here's that. Let's call this guy. Here's this. Let's call this guy. Here's that. So it's all concurrent, it's all asynchronous, it's all good. Let me bring up the announcement demo. And let's start by looking at the various code you have to write. On the discovery service side, exactly the same thing. It's just one line you will ever need. On the service side, exactly the same thing, one line. On the client side, you have to now implement that sync. And so look at what that needs to do. You basically create an announcement sync. And you create an announcement sync, and you open it. That's basically the only two lines you would need. Now, optionally, you can also set some addresses around. You go about, and you just grab the address out, and you call it like a regular proxy. So now if you run everything, And so if I call it now, it's, it's going to work. But um, let me actually do the following. Let me go and close the service. So if I close the service, now actually it, it, there's going to be nothing. I'm going to have some kind of an error, some kind of an exception, because the service is not here. So maybe I should do it in parts. I'm, I'm going to launch a discovery service. And I'm going to launch uh, the client. If I'm just going to try and evoke it now, I'm going to blow up. I'm going to launch now a service. Service is up. It's going to announce. And therefore, I can freely just go and uh, use it. And here it is. So there's really less to this than meets the eye as far as the usage. All the smarts went into the kung fu of the implementation of the framework uh, behind it.
What I showed you today in this uh, webcast is actually going to be in the next edition of uh, Programming WCF. We hope to publish this book in next year, probably early next year. You can find all the code for the demos I did today in the download section of the iDesign website. And I'm sure we're going to see some lively discussions on the iDesign Lumi forum regarding this particular technique. Let me also say special thanks for Monty for reviewing this code and meticulously improving it as I was uh, slinging it. We're also going to add this material to the Architects Masterclass. The next class is coming up March next year. And if we're talking about uh, iDesign Masterclasses, we also have the November class, the Project Design Masterclass, which is the natural follow-up for the Architects Masterclass. If you're serious about your career as an architect, then the Project Design Masterclass is, is simply a must. That basically concludes what I had to say. Thank you all for watching this webcast. Let's take some questions offline, and thank you all.